Oh, yeah. So thank you, everybody, for coming today to the Research Methods Community. We're not an interest group, we're a community. Uh, uh, annual Doctoral and Junior Faculty Consortium. Uh, and uh, today we're going to talk about endogeneity. And I, I'm just going to preface this by, by, by pointing out that uh, a lot of what you'll hear today is really on the frontier like the very much on the frontier uh, I, that that uh, exists in in the econometrics in the social science field. So I, I'm very excited about about that. Uh, we're going to start with um, Evan Starr of the University of Maryland. Uh, Evan needs no introduction, so I'm not going to give him one. Uh, I, this is co-organized with my co-conspirator Sarah Wolfaltz. Um, she's up at at Cornell. Uh, in Ithaca, uh, and um, also does does uh, doesn't really need uh, an introduction. And then Chris Ryder, who used to be at Georgetown, now now at in in Ann Arbor, um, I guess like right here or something. And uh, he's going to be talking uh, a little bit about graphing uh, and 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 using pictures to help us understand data as well. So uh, Evan. Um, and, and just in terms of how we're going to organize the seminar, I'm not sure if everybody heard that. We're going to go Evan, Sarah, Chris, questions, and we're going to do that in two hours. So let's go, Evan. It's all you. Brent, are they are they are, are questions allowed in the chat, et cetera? Yes, questions are allowed in the chat. I'm going to monitor the chat. Um, please, if you, uh, and then we'll determine. Um, sometimes it's better to just for me to just convey the question. Sometimes it's better for that person to ask it themselves. Well, depends. Um, and and off we go. Okay, awesome. Um, well, thank you so much um, uh, for having me, Brent. Um, and uh, so excited to see the other presentations uh, today. Um, I'm going to present a paper that has many co-authors, which are all former or current grad students of Brent and mine. Uh, and this is a paper that's, uh, that we're calling what to do if you're identifying assumptions might not hold. And uh, we're going to study this in the context of patenting and employee mobility. And so um, let, me, uh, let me first give a shout out to my awesome grad students, uh, Shotaro, uh, who just had a kid uh, a few weeks ago, Taki, who's a first year student at Maryland, and Anthony, who's leaving George Washington for Purdue, and then uh, the uh, well-known Justin Frake already. So I believe some of them may be here on the chat. So they can answer questions as we're going along if you have them. If I butcher, um, if I butcher the explanations, they they will uh, surely uh, uh, help me out. So, um, so let's get started here. The, the motivation for this this paper, and it, it is a real paper here, is that the credibility the credibility revolution in, in econ and management of the social sciences has emphasized identification strategies to answer causal questions. So these are ones you're certainly familiar with. Things like differences and differences, instrumental variables, or even just as simple as controlling for all the possible confounders in, in, your, uh, in, your, in your empirical design. Uh, but we, we know that the internal validity of all of these methods depends on untestable identifying assumptions. Okay, so in the diff and diff context, it requires parallel trends to occur in the post period between your treated group and your control group. In the IV context, for example, it requires that your instrument doesn't affect your outcome through any other path except through the treatment variable of interest, right? So uh, these are fundamentally untestable propositions. Uh, and so the question is, what do you, know, what do, you do uh, when they might hold, when they might not hold? Okay, so the research questions we, we address in this paper is, well, first, what do researchers do in these contexts? And then what can researchers do? And so uh, what we do in this paper is we're gonna study how management researchers discuss identifying assumptions and whether they examine sensitivity of their results to violations or potential violations of those assumptions. And so this is the part that is most in progress in this, in this paper here. Uh, I'll say preliminarily that what we're doing is basically reviewing uh, several uh, papers from uh, all the top management journals and looking at their discussion of identification. And it's pretty clear, uh, even from our very preliminary dive at this point that we rarely discuss the, the precise identifying assumptions that are required for us to believe uh, uh, whether an estimate should be causal or not. And it's even more rare to examine sensitivity to the violation of those assumptions. Uh, usually we just pr presume they're true or hope, hope that they're true. 
And so what the main crux of this paper is to review and implement methods for examining sensitivity to violations of identifying assumptions. So in the context of uh, uh, designs where you're just trying to control for all possible confounders, uh, uh, we're going to review a method by Sinelli and Hazlitt that addresses omitted variables in a very uh, uh, beautiful way. Uh, we're going to look at non-parallel trends in diff and diff designs uh, using a recent method developed by Ramachandra Roth. And then uh, in the NIV designs, we're going to look at what you do uh, if you think your exclusion restriction might be violated. Uh, and so the context we're going to look at here is the effect of a worker's first patent on their subsequent employee mobility. And the data that we're going to use throughout is uh, inventor uh, LinkedIn uh, panel, uh, which was collected initially from uh, G et al. Uh, in a 2016 SMJ paper. They posted their data publicly. And what we have done, uh, th their, their data collection ended in 2013. We have rescraped their the LinkedIn profiles up to uh, 2022. And so, uh, so that's the source of data here. So, you know, in a lot of a lot of patent mobility data, you have issues around uh, you, you can't observe moves, for example, uh, if somebody didn't patent at their new employer. And so uh, we overcome that by having LinkedIn data. And so we have a different selection problem, which is, you know, it's not random who's on LinkedIn and it's not random who updates their profile. Uh, but but this is a, a, a nice work around here. Okay, so uh, so why are we studying patents and employability? Let me just give a shout out to this literature and why we think this research question in itself is is really important. Uh, I mean, we, we know from a broad literature going back at least to Arrow in the 1960s that employment mobility is an important conduit uh, for knowledge diffusion, right? Uh, and if you if you look at some of the prior literature. The conclusion effectively seems to be that if a firm patents, they can both protect their the firm's knowledge by uh, uh, by having a legal monopoly over that over that invention, uh, but that also limits the outflow of workers. And I think the kind of the the canonical interpretation of that is that what's happened is that the if you think about the workers' full human capital, a patent takes some of that workers' knowledge and it ties it directly to the firm via the patent. And so the patents effectively uh, create firm specific human capital in the workers, which are by definition not valuable elsewhere, and that kind of holds on to the workers uh, effectively. So the patenting is a, is a, is a two way, or it's a, you get two birds with one stone, you get protection and you get uh, a retention uh, of inventive employees. Uh, but I think there, there's some reason to, to, at least theoretically, to challenge this view, which is that receiving a patent, uh, especially your very first patent, may be a signal that could increase external demand for the worker, right? So it's costly to develop a patent, but something you put on a resume that can really help you set, uh, set you apart. And so it may, it may uh, stimulate external demand. Um, the other reason we're studying this question is that this literature by and large has not investigated the sensitivity of results to violations to identify assumptions. This is in fact true of almost every literature and strategy. So that's not specific to this particular research question. Uh, but the real value of this research question is that we can apply all of these methods uh, to this particular question and to this particular context. Okay, so that so lots of reasons to, to look here. Okay, so uh, so let me just jump right into some to some of what we're going to do. So we're going to start here with a very very simple two way fixed effects regression. Okay, so uh, in our LinkedIn data we have a measure of mobility which is at the year level, and so it's just a dummy for did this employer did this inventor separate from their uh, employer in this year? Okay, so that's the DV. And we're going to regress that on a dummy for when they received their first patent. And, you know, you could receive your first patent in 1995 or in 2000 or 2005. So there's many different times you could receive it. And so uh, we're just having a dummy, which, which varies by individual and by time. Okay, but this is important. It just turns on one time. It's only for your first patent grant. And then we're going to have individual fixed effects here and just time fixed effects. Okay, so very, a very simple model. Uh, and so here's what happens if you run this regression, and we're going to look at two separate uh, uh, ways to think about first patents that are going to be important down the road. Uh, so the DV here, going to uh, whether you separated from your employer in year T, and if you look at patent applications, which is what most of the prior literature has done, looking at patent applications, you find a negative relationship of about uh, 2.1 percentage points. That corresponds to about a 12.9% drop in mobility relative to the sample mean, which is about 16%. Okay, but if you look at uh, whether you, uh, if, if you change the, dependent, or the independent variable of interest and say, okay, well, what if we care about actually receiving the patent, not just applying for the patent, you'll notice that the sign flips. And you might think that's odd. Like, why is the sign flipping? What, what's going on? You know, it doesn't, there's no theoretical reason maybe that we would expect that to happen, or at least that we haven't, we haven't thought through. Uh, 
And so maybe your, your, your first natural inclination is that maybe there, there's some violation of the identifying assumptions here. There's something going on with relation to either who applies and their subsequent mobility. Uh, and so one potential story is there's an omitted variable. Okay, so here's one potential omitted variable story that, that we think is natural. So uh, uh, imagine some workers are just more committed to their firm. Maybe their, their spouse works at their firm and, uh, and, and their commute is really short. And so they really are not, are not gonna leave their firm. They're super committed. And so uh, they, uh, because they're committed to the firm, they're really willing to invest in developing a, uh, an invention, but they were also already less likely to leave. Okay, so, so that's a story where, you know, uh, workers who have some, you know, some propensity to be committed to their firm might be underlying uh, some of these negative mobility effects that we observe for patent applications. So if you think this is a problem here, and, and, you, and you should, uh, then the question is, what do you do? Okay, so how sensitive should we think of these patent, uh, patent results being to omitted variables? And so I want to talk about a method that was developed by Sinelli and Hazlitt. Uh, in, in 2020. And there are several other approaches which I'll touch on uh, at, at the back end here. Okay, so the intuition for, for this method and all of the other ones is that omitted variables create bias because the omitted variable affects the outcome and they affect the treatment. So I have to go through a little bit of, a little bit of algebra here to show you how that works. So imagine that your true data generating process looks something like this. Okay, you've got your outcome Y and then D is your treatment variable of interest. X is some controls. And Z is gonna be a variable that affects your outcome, but is actually uh, omitted. Okay, so we're not gonna be able to observe Z. So if you were to run you know, the, the appropriate regression, this is what you would run and you would be able to estimate tau hat perfectly, no problem. But the problem is that you can't observe Z. And so you run this restricted model where you, you omit Z from the regression. And so you're gonna end up with these uh, T hat underscore res, where res just stands for restricted, okay? And so if you just go through some of the standard algebra here, if you just estimate this restricted model, which is what you have to estimate because you can't observe Z, then your restricted estimate of what you're gonna get, uh, your, your tau hat here is gonna be equal to the truth plus some bias term. And we can, we can actually write out exactly what it's gonna be. Uh, your estimate is gonna be equal to the truth plus the, the, uh, the product of two terms, okay? The first term is this delta hat, and delta hat, you'll have to go and circle back to the front, to the, the first equation here. Delta hat is the direct relationship between Z and your outcome variable. Okay, so if you go back to the data generating process, that's where delta hat comes from, okay? The second term is gamma hat. Well, what is gamma hat? Gamma hat comes from this regression. Gamma hat, it reflects how your treatment is related to your uh, unobserved variable. Okay, and so if delta was positive, that would mean that for those who get treated, they have a higher level of Z on average. Okay, so the method of Sinelli and Hazlitt is very, very simple. Okay, all they do is they take this equation uh, that I've bolded here, and they realize that you can, you estimate T hat res, that comes from your data, and then you can just basically do a grid search for different values of delta and gamma, and for different values of delta and gamma, that will help you back out what the truth is, okay? And the way that they show this is via a contour plot. All right, so the way, the way to look at this graph is first think about, first look at the axes here. The axes are first, uh, the axes are the delta and the gamma. So gamma is on the y-axis here. Delta is on the x-axis here. And if we start from our unadjusted estimate of negative 0.021 in the patent application analysis, you can then specify for different levels of gamma and delta what they might be and the co the uh, the contour lines here tell you what your then what then what your true estimate is, okay. And so the, maybe what you really care about here is this: uh, if the truth is zero, right? Then uh, then what you would need is you would need delta and gamma to be such that you end up on this red line, okay. So for example, if your delta was fifteen, uh, then you would need approximately uh, you know a gamma of fifteen, okay, in order in order to kill your point estimate. So you estimate negative point two one. But if gamma was point was fifth was 0.15, yeah, delta was 0.2, 0.15, you'd get about that the truth was really zero and you're being biased. Okay. So this is this fundamentally is 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 their approach. It's, it's going to be all graphical, which is why it's so nice. But there's a there's one extra richness here, which is that I've talked about one potential omitted variable, which is maybe someone's committed commitment to the firm. But there are many confounders. They can they can interact uh, with each other. Right. So how do you how do you specify this for all possible confounders 
potentially working together. Okay, different confounders could have different scales. And so you can imagine if you're trying to do this, it's just going to get very messy. So the key idea in Sinelli and Hazlitt is that we can convert these delta and gamma values into partial R squareds. Okay, so, uh, so that, if you do that, the graph then looks like this. Okay, and now all I've, all I've changed here is I've made the y-axis the partial R squared of, the, of all potential confounders uh, with the outcome and the partial R squared of confounders with the treatment. Okay, so it's all, everything is conceptually the same it's just that now, instead of the, the coefficient, I now have partial R squares. Okay, so I'm gonna spend a moment walking through this figure here uh, to tell you, tell you how much you can learn by this. All right, so, so here are the benefits of the Sinelli and Hazlitt method. Okay, and if you wanna implement this, uh, Carlos Sinelli has a Shiny app uh, that you can just plug in and, and run with, it's super easy. They also have a Stata and R code uh, called SenseMaker, which you, can, which you can look at as well. So how do we, how do we think about this graph here? So the partial R squared number is, is, a, is what partial R squared is, is it's the explanatory power after you've residualized out all of the controls. Okay, so it's, it's how much does the confounder explain of your outcome and of your treatment after you've residualized out all of the controls. Okay, so, uh, so again, uh, you, you might have uh, a, few, a few questions here, but, but let, me, let me just talk about, for example, this red dot here, which says effectively, uh, so this red dot occurs at approximately 0.08 on both the y and the x axis. It lies on this 45 degree line here that we've plotted for you. And so what this red, red dot they call, this is the robustness value. And so it, what, what this basically means is if you have a, 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 all of your confounders working together, explain only 8% of both your outcome and your treatment then this will push you to the zero effect line. All you need is 8% of both of those, okay? But of course you could have the confounders that explain, for example, not very much of the treatment, but a lot of the outcome. And that, in that case, you would be at the top of this graph, right? So you may, you may so that's, that's, the, that's to overturn the estimate. You might also care about, well, what about inference? Maybe I wanna know when this is gonna kill the statistical significance. So you can also plot the contour line that corresponds to the 95% confidence interval, which we've done in black here. So this is the black line where if you, if you lie anywhere beyond this black line, you will end up with an, an insignificant result at the 5% level. Okay, so, so what, is the, what is the value then here? So the first thing you can do is this is a, this is a, a scale-free parameterization. This is why it works with all confounders potentially working together. Okay, uh, it, it assesses the sensitivity of a given estimate to all potential confounders or even extreme scenarios. So you can imagine a simple scenario which is uh, if you look at one of the extremes. So if you go all the way down, uh, all the way up on the, on the top axis here. So imagine, for example, that, uh, that the confounders explained all of the residual variation in your outcome. Okay, so this axis doesn't go all the way up to one right here, but imagine it went all the way up to one. That point on at uh, the very top where it goes all the way up to one, what that would mean is that your partial R squared of your kind of the treatment would only, would only have to explain, you know, in this case, it's gonna be about 1% of your, of your treatment in order to kill your result. Okay, so the so it's a, it's a, you know you can do a lot of stuff just with a simple graph, and the last part is that that I think is really valuable is it's really easy to benchmark these results. Okay, so what do I mean? What do I mean benchmark? Well, you might wonder, you know, is it feasible, for example, for a confounder to explain eight percent of both your uh, your treatment and your controls? Uh, sorry, your your treatment and your outcomes. And so what you can do is benchmark it to other individual covariates or sets of covariates. Okay, so in this case, we've just, uh, we had a model, we didn't have any actual specific controls, we just had individual fixed effects and your fixed effects. And so what we're going to do is benchmark it to the whole set of individual fixed effects. And so what this, what, what these dots on the bottom here tell you, this individual FE times 0.51, this says, if all of the confounders have as much explanatory power as 51% of the individual fixed effects, then that will kill our result. Okay, if they, if they have the same explanatory power of individual fixed effects, it's more than going to reverse our result. Okay, so that's, that, is the, that is the, I think, the value of this, of this approach. Uh, it tells you a lot of information. It's easy to benchmark. Okay, there are two other approaches that, that you probably have heard of uh, that have come about recently. Uh, there's the uh, impact threshold uh, approach from Frank. Uh, there's a, a Emily Oster has a paper on 2019 that has this method. Let me talk about this, this briefly. Uh, what I think is the benefit of the Sinelli and Hazlitt approach is that I think it has a really clear interpretation. Uh, even Emily Oster admits that it's not clear what her Oster's delta means. Uh, and the, the problem, in my view, boils down to this. 
Omitted variables are fundamentally a two-dimensional problem. You have to worry about how the confounders are related to your treatment and your outcome. And any attempt to boil down that, uh, that problem to a single statistic, a single dimension, is going to have interpretation issues. And that's both, that's what Frank and Oster do, is they boil it down to one dimension, and, and that's, that's where all the interpretation problems come in. So Snellian has, I think, is very clear. I think it improves our, our, our understanding of what's going on and whether we think our results are likely to be overturned by omitted variables. Okay, so uh, so that's that's the first approach here. Now, in our in our context, right? Uh, there's uh, we ran a two-way fixed effects model, but it turns out, as you may be aware, that two-way fixed effects models can be really messed up and really biased. And we've learned, in fact, that two-way fixed effects models, the relevant uh, identifying assumption, is actually not one of conditional dependence, but actually one of parallel trends. And that's because two-way fixed effects models are really just aggregated d uh, difference and difference models. Okay, and so. Uh, Goodman Bacon in 2021 has this paper where he shows that a two-way fixed effects model is a weighted average of individual diff and diff comparisons between groups that receive treatment at different times. Okay, and the, the problem arises as follows. If the effects of the treatment are dynamic, so that they grow over time or they shrink over time, or they're heterogeneous, then the two-way fixed effects can be badly biased. And what's happening is that implicitly there's a forbidden comparison, which OLS naturally includes here, which is between those who have been treated later and those who have been treated earlier. And so if you have dynamic treatment effects, that comparison is going to bias your overall results. Okay, and so if you haven't seen this paper by Baker at all, I think this is this clearly displays the intuition of, of the idea in the best possible way. In this situation, uh, we have uh, just a simulation, just random data, where we have created staggered adoption. There's a, uh, in this case, uh, you know, some, someone's adopting something in 89, somebody in, uh, you know, the blue one in, in 97, and then the green one, I believe in, in 2007, but maybe there's no effect, but you can see the effects are different. The red is the biggest effect, blue is smaller, green is even smaller. So if you were to just run a two-way fixed effects model with this, with this data generating process, you know, you would hope that you would uncover a positive point estimate because uh, all of these effects are positive. But if you do it, then uh, the distribution here on your left, you'll see that you actually get a negative point estimate. And the reason is because the red group is being compared as the control to the blue and the green. And the red group has the largest effect. And that's what reverses your sign. Okay, so this is a huge problem in our data because all of our inventors actually are, are, are eventually patent, right? That's where we, start. we started with a, with a database of inventors. So everybody eventually patents. So this is gonna be a big problem for us. Uh, fortunately, there are several new estimators that resolve this issue. Okay, and so uh, the relevant identifying assumption here is is uh, is actually revolves around parallel trends. Uh, now you can't you can't test for parallel trends in the post period, but but you can look in the pre period. Okay, right. So this is the key issue. You can never observe what would have happened to the control group or to the treated group if they weren't treated. Okay, so that's the key problem. And so we're going to adopt the approach of Calo and Santana, which is one of the I think the most well adopted methods here. Uh, and they basically work by constructing a group time average treatment effect estimator. And they use a, a, a propensity score method, which is, was initially sort of developed in Abadi et al. in 2005. And then they average these together to create these event study estimates. Okay, so in our context, we're gonna have a reference period, which is seven years before uh, you actually um, uh, uh, get a patent grant or you get uh, an application. So let me show you what this looks like. Okay, so, uh, so what we're comparing here are inventors who are going to invent uh, who are going, in this case, who are going to get up, who are going to receive a patent at, at t equals zero. And we're, we're comparing them to people who have not yet received a patent. Okay, that's the, that's the comparison. All right. And you'll notice something that looks a little bit weird here. So at, at, at t minus seven, we've normalized that to be the benchmark here. And you'll see that the people who are going to patent have much less mobility in the next six years, but then it starts increasing again. And by the time we hit year zero, by the time they actually receive the grant, uh, we're back to where we were, and then it's kind of noisy from then on out. But all of the action here is actually occurring in the pre-period, you know, up to six years before. So you might think that's a little weird. So let me show you the same graph for patent applications. So if you do patent applications, this, this is what, what you see. So here, the, the, uh, the independent variable interest is the year that you have uh, submitted a patent, and the reference are people who have not yet submitted a patent application. Okay, so if you, if you just eyeball this graph, You'll notice that uh, what's happening is, you know, basically in, in the pre-period, <clears throat> there's a bit of an uptick in T minus three. We don't want to make too much of that. Uh, but in T minus two and T minus one, these workers are much less likely to leave. It maxes out here. 
And this is actually an enormous effect. Like if you just look at this, this is actually, uh, uh, you know, the point estimate here is about 0 0.07, which is a 43% decrease relative to the sample average of 16%. Okay, this is a very large decrease we're finding here in the pre-period. And, uh, and then you'll see it rises then back afterwards. Okay, so, uh, so what, what, what is this? Well, so we're calling this the inventor's dip. And if you know a little bit of labor economics, you might know uh, about Ashenfelter's dip, uh, which is from Orly Ashenfelter's 1978 paper, which is very famous, uh, which is about training programs. And the question they were looking at is what's the effect of a training program? And the key result was that if you look at who enters a training program, it's the people who just lost a job. So their earnings fall right before the, they enter the training program and then they rise afterwards. Okay, and so after Orly, we're calling this uh, the inventor's dip. Okay, uh, so so you, the, so you look at these graphs. Okay, so one thing that might jump out to you is like it looks like in the patent application graph, the drop comes at t minus two and t minus one, but in the in the patent grant analysis, it comes at t minus six. You might wonder what the heck is going on there. So uh, so the 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 answer is that sometimes patents are granted quickly, sometimes patents are granted slowly, and so uh, if you just look at the time between a patent application and grant, we can see that really all of the action here is coming from uh, when you apply. Okay, so, so in this graph, well, I'm showing you the, uh, the years since first patent application, but I'm just going to cut it based on the length of the review period. So people got a one year review, a three year review, or a five year review. Okay, so it's going to take, so in this graph, it's going to take the yellow group five more years to get their patent, right? Uh, but you can see that the pattern for everybody is exactly the same, right? They all drop in the year, especially in the year before, it's a very large effect. If, if you look at patent grants uh, with the same thing, you'll just see that all we've done is basically shifted our analysis. So uh, you'll see the big drop for the yellow group coming at T minus six, which is five years before T minus one. If you see uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the green line, those are who have a three year review and that's at negative four and their dip was at you know, negative one, so three years. And then the group uh, uh, who is, who's black is a one year review and you see their dip happening again at negative two, negative one. So, so the difference between those, the, the really long dip in grants was really just driven by, by different um, uh, time to review. Okay, so a question is why do we observe an inventor's dip here? And, and one hypothesis that we have, <clears throat> which we haven't done much work on, but we have a hypothesis, I think it's natural, is that people wanna finish what they're working on before they leave. You're working on a project, you're embedded, you know, you're excited about it. And so you, you're, you, know, you, you work on this project and you're more committed to your firm during that time period than, than you would otherwise be. Okay, so if this is true, if this is what's going on, then what you need for a control group here is you need the control group to also be working on a project that ends at the same time. Okay, so you need, you need, you need a worker who is, uh, who is also on a project, not a patent application, but some sort of project that is going to uh, end at the same time, or maybe a patent, but that didn't get approved. Uh, and that then, so therefore they match the pre-trends. Okay, that's what you need. Okay, but as in oh, Ashenfelter's paper, uh, it's very hard to construct this, this control group. Okay, and furthermore, because of this dip, you're going to end up overstating the positive effects of patents on, on mobility, because in the pre-period, you've got this big drop, and so in the post-period, it's going to look like there's an effect, even though there may not be. Okay, so if you have non-parallel trends like this, what the heck can you do? Well, fortunately, uh, Rambachan and Roth come to our rescue here in a very recent working paper, uh, where their idea is that if you have pre-treatment violations of parallel trends, you can use those to inform what might be possible violations of the post-treatment trends uh, and, and, and do inference, assuming that effectively the post-treatment trends are gonna look like the pre-treatment trends, okay? So what does that look like in practice? Well, they have, uh, so here's our, here's our graph with the, with the terrible pre-treatment trends. <clears throat> and, and so their, their procedure is called Honest DID, it's an R package and they account for different restrictions. Now you can do different, different sets of restrictions here. <clears throat> you can do what they call a relative magnitude restriction. So you can take, the max difference in the period to period uh, difference in the pre-trends. So compare T minus one, T minus two to T minus two, T minus three, figure out that max difference and, and then uh, figure out, okay, well, if we thought that difference was going to appear in the post period, uh, how would that change our inference? What if it was two times that difference or half that difference? Okay, you can also do, uh, you can also do uh, smoothness restrictions. You can assume that uh, if there's lots, if there's no smoothness in the pre-period that you might also observe similar lack of smoothness in the post period. Uh, and then you can also do uh, sign and monotonicity restrictions. So if it looks like the bias is increasing, or sorry, the pre-trends are increasing, then you want to uh, let that flow into the post period, then you can do that. Okay, so, so let me just apply this with the relative magnitude, magnitude approach. I think it's going to be the easiest to see here. 
So, <clears throat> so the basic idea here is that the post trends, the difference in the post trends, which we can we never observe, can be no greater than some m bar times the max in the period to period difference in the pretrend. So what does that mean? Okay, so let's just look at two comparisons here. Let's look at t minus one and, uh, and t plus seven. And so uh, if you look at uh, the max difference in the period to period pretrends, that difference is biggest here at negative two, negative one. Okay, so basically what we then do is we then apply that difference to, uh, to, to, to the t plus seven and we take the remaining difference here between <clears throat> our t plus seven estimate and the t minus one estimate with the difference then applied. Okay, so this would be if m bar equals one, this yellow gap is what would be our residual difference. And we would do inference on whether that's different from zero. Okay, so, uh, so what Rambachan and Roth do is they say, look, how big does m bar have to be uh, to, fail, uh, if you want to, uh, to make you fail to reject a null of no difference? Okay, so here is, uh, here is that graph. So uh, on the y-axis here, this blue one is our initial estimate that assumes perfectly parallel pretrends. You would see, you would look at this and you would say, look, we've got a positive point estimate. <clears throat> that, that confidence interval is above, it's above zero. So great, we're good. But it turns out if you just have a, uh, uh, you know, an M here of like 0.25 um, would, would, would kill us. So if, there, if there's a difference here of, you know, just 25% of this max difference that I've shown you, that would kill uh, uh, our inference in this case. Okay. All right. So the last thing I know, I'm going to a few minutes over here. So bear with me. We're almost done. So, so you may look at this graph and you say, okay, Evan, I don't believe that the max, the relative magnitude approach is the best one. Maybe there's another one. Okay, fine. But ultimately, there's this really non-parallel, non-linear pretrends in this case of, uh, in, in our case. And so the question is like, what, what can you do? Maybe, maybe Roth and Ramachan are not actually helpful in that context. And so we're going to consider one, one final approach, which is instrumental variables. Okay. Now, the, the natural instrument here is examiner leniency. This was used uh, to great effect in a recent paper in management science by uh, Eduardo Malero and Nuz Palomares and David Werheim. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so the basic idea looks like this. Patents may be quasi-randomly assigned to examiners. Okay, and if examiners differ in their leniency, just their, their likelihood of granting a patent, then some patents are accepted simply because they got a luck, they got a lucky draw, they got a lenient examiner, and some patents are rejected randomly because they happen to get a stringent examiner. Okay, so ideally, this would isolate plausibly exogenous variation in who is going to receive a patent, conditional on somebody applying. Okay, and that uh, so so if you want to look at it in a DAG. This is the basic situation. You may have some unobserved confounders, but examiner leniency hopefully impacts whether you get your first patent <clears throat> and then later uh, job separation. But this is the only path that works here. So if you if you do this, if you run this regression uh, with examiner leniency, uh, then this is what you get. So the first stage is very strong. If you have a more lenient examiner, you're, you're much more likely to move. Uh, <clears throat> If you, uh, if you just look at the reduced form, which is looking at how examiner leniency relates to mobility, we also see a positive effect. And if you remember your IV, IV is just the ratio of these two, uh, these two effects. Okay, so our two stage least squares is about an effect size of 0 0.079. It's significant precisely at the 5% level, uh, <clears throat> which is great because we got to put that whole extra star on this table. Uh, but it is an enormous effect size, you guys. Remember the mean here, uh, actually, this is a slightly different subsample. I don't have time to get into it, but this the average mobility here is about 17.9% of the subsample, so 18% mobility. So what we have we have estimated here is a 44% increase in mobility from receiving a patent. And you might look at that and say, oh, that that is that real, Evan? Like, how can that I, I don't know. It seems very large to us. Okay. So when you see something like that, you might think, well, okay, something's going on, something funny is going on. So the question is, could the exclusion restriction be violated here? So what does that mean? Well, if you look at a recent paper by Cesar Riggi and Tim Simcoe, we know that patents are not in fact randomly assigned, just like when you submit your papers uh, to SMJ or, or uh, you know, anywhere, they're, they're not randomly assigned. The editors are picking people specific to your topic, right? And that's happening at the USPTO as well. Examiners specialize in certain areas, they're more likely to get certain patents. And so that's what Riggi and Simcoe show. And so what this means is that examiner leniency is not exogenous, it might in fact be related to job separation through some other path, except through that first patent. Okay, and so this is a, the DAG with, uh, with what happens when you have a violation of the exclusion restriction. Now, one, one important point is that you can't actually test the exclusion restriction. Sometimes it's recommended, for example, to include both uh, your patent grant in the, in, the, in the regression and the instrument. But, but if you do that, you create collider bias 
with the, with the patent grant and it's gonna open up a backdoor channel and so you can't interpret the coefficients because of the, the backdoor channel that now creates a spurious relationship. Okay, um, I learned that the hard way this year when I posted something very dumb on Twitter and was promptly corrected. Okay, so, uh, so what do you do in this situation? Well, several things are possible. Okay, so there's a, a classic paper by, by uh, John Bound and David Yeager who have this idea of a zero first stage test. Okay, so the, the whole idea is that maybe you can exploit some situation where you know for sure that the first stage should not exist, that it can't exist. Okay, so in their case, they were revisiting this classic paper by Angers and Kruger on compulsory schooling laws. They found that Angers and Kruger's results held when there were no compulsory schooling laws and that, that killed, that, that, that was one of the many uh, uh, daggers in that paper, okay? But if you found a subsample where you know the first stage is zero, and yet you still find that your instrument affects your outcome of interest, then you know the exclusion restriction is violated because you know that the first stage is not there. So there must be another path connecting the instrument to the outcome, okay? So that's, that's the idea. The problem is it's, you know, this requires deep contextual knowledge. It's not always, it's not always obvious. We, we can't do it here. Uh, we don't we don't know a subgroup where there's no relationship whatsoever uh, between um, between uh, uh, receiving a, uh, uh, between the examiner leniency and and receiving the patent. Okay, uh, so what else can you do? Well, here's Conley et al. This is the one we're going to talk about. Uh, Conley et al. have a paper uh, called Plausibly Exogenous, and the question is how strong a violation of the exclusion restriction would change your inference. Okay, so the, I have to go through a little bit of math, but the, it looks like this. So you have uh, this basic equation here where y equals xb plus gamma z. And the whole idea is that uh, z is your instrument. And ideally, you want gamma to be 0. Okay, That would mean that there's no relationship between, gamma, between z and y. Okay, But hopefully, there is, there is a first stage, which is the second equation, that z does affect x. But you want gamma to be 0. Uh, so if you, if you were to just do those simple econometrics of what you get with this two-stage least squares estimator, you're, you're going to, again, get that uh, your two-stage least squares estimate will converge to the truth plus this ratio. And the ratio is the direct effect of the instrument on y divided by the first stage, okay, pi. And so all what they do is they say, well, we can estimate pi. We know that from the first stage. The question is, how do you do inference if the gamma is not zero? Okay, and so that's, that's the whole approach, all right? I also want to mention there is another approach that's less popular by Nevo and Rosen. Uh, which, which involves uh, uh, making assumptions about the correlation between the error terms and the instrument and the error terms and your uh, endogenous regressor. So we're not going to talk about that one. It's less popular, but I think this one, this one has a little bit more clarity. Okay, so the problem here is, how do you know what reasonable, what reasonable ideas of gamma are? And so uh, Van Kippers, Lewis, and Riedveld say, well, this is a problem. And so their, their approach is to basically integrate Bound and Jaeger with Conley. And they say, look, if you have a zero first stage, uh, that, that you know from like the Bound and Jaeger approach, then you can use that to bound what gamma might be, okay? And then from there on, you can use uh, the plausibly exogenous methods. Okay, so that's basically it. So if we, if we look at the plausibly exogenous results, there's several ways to implement this. You can specify the whole distribution of gamma. You can look at different levels of gamma uh, uh, and see how your results change. But, but this, is, this is the uniform uh, confidence interval approach that they, <clears throat> that they, that they recommend. And here are our point estimates on patent. Here's the range of estimates for patent grants for different levels of gamma. And so, uh, if gamma is zero, you can see our point estimates here are, uh, you know, are slightly above zero. This is 95% confidence interval. Uh, and you can see that the lower bound here drops off. So if gamma, if gamma is positive at all, then we, we we're going to lose significance to the 95% confidence level. And so the question is that we have to ask ourselves: Is are those whose applications are sent to more lenient examiners? Are they more mobile for any reason? And if that's true, then, then we are gonna, we're going to lose the statistical significance on, on this effect. You can also, also figure out what gammas are going to overturn your results, like kind of like Sinelli and Hasley. Okay. All right. So, so let me just wrap up here. I realize I'm a few minutes over. So thank you for bearing with me. Uh, so what have we done here? Hopefully, we've, we've talked about three methods that researchers can use to assess how robust your results are to violations of identifying assumptions in uh, designs we are controlling for confounders, where you're doing diff and diff, or where you're doing instrumental variables. Uh, and in our context, we think that these methods lead to some new insights on the patent mobility relationship. Okay, I think our, our, our key contribution, as I see it, is that we are identifying this inventor's dip before the patent application. And, and, and this makes, this has two things. One is that it's hard to find a valid control group. 
right? Uh, and so you may not want to believe either the two-way fixed effects models, or you may not want to believe the diff and diff models, right? And so the, 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 the results that you would maybe rely on the most here are the IV models, where in this case, we find that patent grants are associated with increased mobility, which if we go back to the original theory, suggests some perhaps signaling value to receiving a first patent. And uh, again, I want to highlight though that we should be cautious because these results are very sensitive to the violation of the exclusion restriction. The point estimates themselves are ginormous, 44%, if you recall. And so, uh, so we, should have, we should interpret this with a little bit of caution. I also want to highlight that these results appear to be in the opposite direction of the literature, where the prior literature has found that, uh, that patent applications and grants are, are negatively associated with employee mobility. And so that raised the question of why we observe these differences. And I think there are many possible ones. We haven't resolved, we haven't resolved it. I don't know if we're going to be able to. But a few of the differences between us and what the prior literature is looking at is we are looking at only your first patent. We have this you know, highly selected LinkedIn subsample. We have a sampling window that is relatively fixed, uh, and we are using different fixed effect structures and other uh, slight differences from the rest of the, uh, the literature here, which I don't have time to get into. But anyway, so that, that, that's it. That's it. I realize I'm like 10 minutes over. So uh, thank you all for sticking with me. Happy to answer any questions, or hopefully uh, some of my co-authors have, uh, but hope this is useful for you. Great, great, thank you. So in, in the interest of time, um, we're going to move to to Sarah uh, and, and and her presentation. There there is a comment or or two in the chat to panelists, which not everybody can see. And Evan, I'll invite you to respond to that uh, as we go. All right. Well, let me share my screen. Um, let's see. All right, we good? You can see my screen all right? All right, perfect. So, um, whoops, I just went away, sorry. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, thanks everyone for joining and that was a fantastic presentation, Evan. I'm definitely going to, a number of points in my presentation will say, hey, and if you wanna figure out how to deal with this, go back to Evan's slides and, and their paper. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit, I took some leniency in the title uh, or the, uh, the topic for this um, presentation. And I'm actually gonna go back to an old method, um, but talk a little bit about um, kind of highlighting some ways to talk about the use of instrumental variables technique, techniques and why I'm kind of spending time um, on this. Okay, so I don't need to tell this audience, obviously you know, people care a lot about uh, you know, examining causal relationships. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the Nobel Prize from last year was they said, you know, part of the big contribution was um, you know, this first line here, framing instrumental variables analysis in the potential outcomes framework, it becomes clear that there are two distinct assumptions going into the exogeneity assumption, namely randomization and exclusion. So um, what am I going to talk about today? So I'm going to talk about weak instruments, um, but in particular weak instruments um, and kind of in conjunction with the point that Evan was just making. Um, so weak instruments in cases where in fact your instrument might not be completely exogenous. Um, so I'll talk briefly about, you know, what are weak instruments? I'm sure most of you have seen this before. So I'll talk about this really, really quickly or have heard about weak instruments. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how do researchers think about approaching these issues? Um, why does this approach matter? And then, you know, how are we going to deal with these issues, right? So I'll highlight uh, a couple of the new recent methods, um, but more so a broader way to think about how we should potentially be approaching instrumental variables uh, approaches. So I should say that this is based on a paper with Jordan Siegel. Um, so that's uh, currently a working paper. Uh, hopefully we'll have it uh, out to share shortly. Okay, so um, again, I won't spend much time on this because Evan just provided a fantastic um, overview. So we know what endogeneity is, right? It's, uh, it's the idea that in, in general, what we're trying to do is establish causal, causal relationships, being able to conclude that you know, X causes Y. Um, and so we can think that X causes y if you know y follows x, y changes as x changes, and there's not kind of something else going on essentially that could eliminate that relationship between x and y. And so in general, you know, we focus a lot about on this third condition, right? Um, so failure of that third condition occurs if x is endogenous. Um, and we can think about this occurring for a number of reasons. So you know, emitting a regressor, simultaneity, selection bias, et cetera. Um, and so again, if we think about the equation of interest, 
right? So suppose we're looking for beta in this equation, um, so regression of y on x. So in, in OLS, we would estimate that beta, right, with a, with a beta hat, uh, which is the covariance of x and y over the variance of x. Um, and then we can simplify beta hat to be kind of a function of the true value of beta, uh, beta star. So one of the, you know, one, I would say simplification, because it's actually a little bit more complicated than this, but one uh, uh, simplification of uh, why we might think OLS is unbiased is, is if the covariance of X and the error term is zero. And so, and a lot of times we think about X as being endogenous if in fact that covariance is not zero. So how does endogeneity bias results? So if you think about a classic strategy question, right, what are the profitability implications of diversification? Then we can think about, you know, suppose X also on that right-hand side is a level of diversification and we're trying to explore its effect on Y, the profitability of firm I. And suppose that you as a researcher, you know, you can't properly control for managerial skill. And you think that more skilled managers are more likely to pursue diversification they're, you know, they're more likely to pursue better diversification prospects. And at a given level of diversification, they're more likely to generate higher profits. So then if we were to run an OLS regression of profit on diversification, we would overestimate the returns to diversification, right? This coefficient, that beta hat, would reflect both kind of returns to diversification and returns to managerial skill. So we call this affirmative bias, right? So this is kind of the directionality of, of the bias in that, in that example. Um, on the other hand, if you have kind of the covariance of X and the uh, error term to be less than zero, then OLS would underestimate the coefficient of interest and you would have what we call corrective bias. And so I'll be returning a lot to this directionality and that's why I highlight, uh, bothered kind of putting up these first two slides is I think this is actually really key. Uh, okay, so why do we care? So um, you know, obviously there's a, a key idea of the strategy field is that firms are heterogeneous and, you know, managers choose a strategy based on this heterogeneity, right? So um, this is particularly important in strategic management research. And luckily there's a lot of, you know, there's a number of great papers that are thinking about um, providing really nice, concise presentations of the issue of endogeneity and strategy research. So what I'm going to talk about um, today is the issue of weak instruments and instrumental variable techniques. So why do we think this is really important? So it's, it's really important because I think there, there's generally a prevailing wisdom that essentially weak instruments will bias coefficients towards ordinary least squares, right? So, you know, yes, it's an issue because it might blow up your standard errors, but, you know, it's, if, if you find something significant and you kind of have a weakish instrument, it's probably actually okay because you're probably biased towards zero, right? That's kind of been a prevailing wisdom. Um, and in fact, you know, a number of researchers have said that in their papers. The issue is if there is some endogeneity in the instrument, as Evan was just showing in that, in that large uh, estimate, that resulting bias could actually be magnified by the presence of a weak instrument. So, um, there's a law a researcher who made a strong case for essentially considering and using the expected direction of bias to drive the interpretation of results and the use of instrumental variable techniques. And so what we kind of do in this paper is we do, a, we have a meta-analysis and a replication uh, that a number of replications. And what we find is in the meta-analysis is that very few papers actually kind of consider or discuss the expected direction of bias in the OLS estimates. Um, and so I would say that this, you know, frankly, might be even more problematic um, due to the fact that, you know, with publication bias, you might even be more inclined to see kind of these inflated estimated coefficients. Okay, so um, let me just motivate it a little bit more. So uh, this was the, just the last few years, we looked at papers published in SMJ that use instrumental variable techniques. And so a couple things I would point out about this table is that, and, and I think why, what motivated us to write this paper is that it does seem that a lot of the approaches and uses of instrumental variables uh, techniques have actually done quite well, right? So like those top, you know, three or four lines, you get the vast majority of papers talking about instrument relevance, you know, talking about source of bias. I think we've definitely seen the improvement in our use of um, IV approaches in that sense. On the flip side, you see almost nobody talking about expected direction of bias, right? So you have like only a few of the papers talking about 
you know, in what way would the endogeneity occur, but also if our instrument was in fact endogenous, you know, how would this affect our results? Um, and again, as I, as I would point out, you know, we expect organizations to make strategic decisions that would improve their outcomes. So we might actually expect OLS to overestimate that true effect, right? We might affect, expect that we should have more cases of that affirmative bias. And so uh, when we look at our, you know, at our papers, so among the papers that present both OLS and IV results, you know, fewer than half actually um, have OLS estimates larger than IV estimates. So only, you know, fewer than half have kind of evidence of affirmative endogeneity. And of the 10 papers that have IV estimates larger or equal to, if you examine their discussion of bias or their discussion of the context, you would actually expect seven of those to have kind of the, the relationship between the IV and OLS estimates switched. So I think there's at least some concern that we are seeing kind of these inflated IV estimates. So let's just talk a little bit about instrumental variable approaches, right? So um, obviously we think about instrumental variables techniques as essentially separating out the, you know, the part of X that is uh, exogenous, Right, so in a two-stage least square, we consider that in, in the example I was discussing before, we have some variable Z that is, you know, related to diversification, but not to managerial skill, uh, or excuse me, not to, not to profit. And so in the first stage regression, we would then, you know, regress X on that instrument Z to get some predicted XI hat. And then we would use that XI hat in the second stage regression, right? So you would get some estimated coefficient, which is now beta hat IV. Um, which looks very similar to the OLS coefficient I was showing before, but of course the covariance is now with X hat as opposed to just X. So you can consider, okay, well, you know, essentially when is I, you know, instrumental variables approach going to perform better than OLS by comparing the bias of uh, the instrumental variables coefficient with that of the OLS coefficient. And so the idea is that, you know, if that, that ratio above is greater than one, and this means that the bias of IV is greater than the bias of, of OLS, right? And so we can rewrite that equation. And what I would you know, uh, suggest here is that you know, a weak instrument essentially means that there's a low correlation between X and Z, right? So that would mean that that right-hand side of the equation is smaller. Um, and thus it's kind of more likely potentially that the bias of IV uh, will be greater than the bias of OLS. That being said, if the correlation between your instrument and the error term is zero, or the instrument is fully exogenous, then that left-hand side is zero and the instrumental variables uh, coefficient will always have a lower level of bias, right? So you can kind of see how the exogeneity of the instrument and the weakness of the instrument are really important to both consider when you consider kind of how biased the instrumental variables coefficient will be relative to that of OLS. So uh, first thing we did in this paper is just run a simulation to kind of you know, show this a little bit uh, in more detail. So uh, just for the sake of time, I won't go in, through it in too much detail, but essentially you know, I simulated data where we had um, Y as an outcome variable, X as an independent variable, Z as an instrument, and then X2 uh, is your omitted variable. And so the idea is, right, if Z is exogenous, then it shouldn't have a direct effect on the outcome variable, right? So that's you know, kind of one thing, one thing that we're varying in the simulation. The other key thing that we're varying in the simulation is the strength of the instrument. And so that's in that, um, in that second equation up above, uh, the relationship between your main um, explanatory variable and the instrument. So what we did in the simulation was, you know, we assumed beta is one. So what we'll be doing is kind of examining the bias relative to what we know to be the true um, coefficient of one by, you know, by design. Um, and then we will vary both the, the strength of the instrument and the endogeneity of the instrument. Uh, and so after we do that, we'll kind of compare, okay, well, what does OLS look like versus two SLS? Uh, so, you know, again, as I said, what we'll vary here is, you know, how strong the instrument is, how bad endogeneity is. So that's the other key thing that we consider, right? So if you're in a case where kind of the need for an instrument is really strong, that also will affect the, how good uh, kind of your IV estimate is versus your OLS estimate. And then lastly, how endogenous the instrument itself 
So again, we're considering, you know, how strong the instrument is, uh, how much an IV method is needed, and then whether or not the instrument is exogenous. Um, we vary all of them. We run 10,000 draws for each, uh, for each type of, each draw of the simulation, each run of the simulation. Okay, so first let's consider affirmative bias. So this is the case where OLS is upwardly biased, right? So this is the case that we consider should be more common if managers are kind of, you know, good managers are more likely to pick strategies that, that maximize profitability. Um, and so what we do in this paper, and I apologize, the formatting is not, um, I mean, in this table, the formatting is not great here. So um, let me just explain what's happening here. So um, the first two columns, we have a strong instrument, the, um, the third and fourth column, a medium instrument, and then the last three, you have a weak instrument. Um, for the sake of brevity, I, I chose this case where endogeneity is high, meaning that this is a case where you think that you really need an instrument because there's a lot of endogeneity in the sample. And then I varied how endogenous the instrument itself is, right? So is it um, kind of slightly endogenous, very endogenous or not endogenous at all? So what do we see here? So if we have a strong instrument, even when the instrument has a medium level of endogeneity, so that first column there, you see that two stage least squares is you know, closer to that true uh, coefficient. The coefficient is beta equals one, uh, then OLS. So it's only when the instrument is highly endogenous that OLS outperforms two stage least squares with a strong instrument. But when you start to move towards a kind of slightly less strong instrument, so here we have a medium instrument, uh, you see that even with a medium strength instrument, if you have a medium level of instrument endogeneity, that in fact OLS gets closer to the true coefficient than two stage least squares. And lastly, with a weak instrument, even if you have a low level of endogeneity, then OLS will provide a less bias coefficient. So with a weak instrument, the only time that two stage least squares performs better is when there is no instrument endogeneity. So with corrective bias, I would say in some sense, it's a little bit um, more confusing. So and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, but this is the case where OLS is biased downward. And so again, um, I, you know, this is table is not presented to make it as, as easy as possible for you, so I apologize. But we vary both the strength of the instrument as well as the level of endogeneity and kind of the model, as well as how endogenous the instrument is. So I'll just present some of the, uh, discuss some of the key results here. So with medium endogeneity, you see that a strong instrument with low levels of instrument endogeneity performs better than OLS, right? So, so basically, you know, if you have a strong instrument, you can tolerate some amount of endogeneity in your instrument and still perform relatively better than OLS. Um, but if you have a medium strength or weak instrument, then again, you will have two stage least squares potentially performing worse. So, um, you know, I think the, the key takeaway here is that a weak instrument will perform worse than OLS even at low levels of instrument endogeneity. So again, if you have a weak instrument, you can essentially tolerate almost no amount of instrument endogeneity. The one thing that I did want to point out, which goes a little bit to what Evan was saying before, was that focusing on the difference in magnitudes does not necessarily reveal the appropriateness of IV versus OLS methods. So I think a lot of people would love there to be like a magic threshold, like, okay, your IV is, you know, five times the size of your OLS, there's definitely, you know, some blow up happening. That, that just like doesn't work, unfortunately. So for instance, consider um, column two here, you get that the IV estimate is like seven times the OLS estimate, right? So that 1.484 versus the 0.231. But in fact, the two stage least squares is closer to the true coefficient estimate, right? And then you look, for instance, at um, the, the last column here, you get two stage least squares is about you know, five times. So less of a kind of blow up versus OLS. But in fact, OLS is closer to two stage least square. So the point just being that you, there's no kind of magic threshold to compare um, difference in magnitudes for IV and OLS estimates. So what would you take away from this? So, you know, I think one of the key things is it's important to consider directionality of bias, right? So if you can kind of use your context and theory um, to know that you're in a case of affirmative bias where OLS should overstate the coefficient, then the IV models will perform worse, obviously, when they overstate the coefficient of interest, interest by even more. 
right? And so this leads you to potentially be able to detect when kind of endogenous and weak instruments will exacerbate bias by comparing the relative size of IV and OLS coefficients. But this is really not possible in all cases. For instance, if you're in a case of corrective bias, uh, you can't just automatically say, you know, the IV is bigger, if that's, if that's a problem. The other thing I would want to point out is that, you know, post-estimation techniques, unfortunately, do not solve, you know, magically solve all your problems. So if I run in my simulation, if I run kind of the standard SATA post-estimation techniques to, to, you know, to test for weak instruments and whatnot, um, they, the instruments aren't weak according to those post-estimation techniques. So it's not like I'm going to run, just because I run those post-estimation techniques, I'm definitely going to guarantee that I don't have an issue. Um, that being said, I think there's some value to the kind of zero first order um, uh, discussion that Evan was having before, because in all of the cases where the instrument um, was, uh, was endogenous, you know, it was statistically significant in the regression of OLS with the instrument, meaning it would have shown up in the first stage had we examined it that way. So I think the takeaways here would be that, you know, even with a small amount of instrument endogeneity, weak instruments can really bias results um, potentially significantly more than OLS models. Okay, so, um, you know, I think that the simulation is showing you hopefully that this is something to be concerned about, but that's not where I want to end it because I think that's not, uh, that's not particularly helpful to researchers and people uh, listening to this presentation. So let me talk a little bit about how we think about dealing with these issues. So uh, in, in the paper, we have a framework and I would say that the, the overarching and I'll, and I'll come back to this in a couple of slides, you know, the overarching takeaway is that, um, you know, as I said, there's no magic threshold, like sometimes the post the standard post estimation techniques don't always work. So um, I think the key takeaway that we would try to emphasize is that it's super important to be transparent about your results. And so, for instance, one of those things means, you know, report your first stage results, uh, you know, report your IV as well as your, uh, excuse me, your OLS as well as your IV um, results and really be transparent about kind of how you would expect bias to occur and whether or not your results are consistent with that. So I think that would be the kind of high level takeaway, but we, we try to outline it with a slightly more detail. So um, first I would say report first stage results. A lot of papers actually continue to not for, uh, report the first stage results when they do two stage least squares. Um, you know, as much as possible, do tests that are available to you, right? So there are some existing ones, they don't necessarily cure all issues, um, a lot of the ones Evan discussed are really improvements on that. So I'm excited to, to see those and learn more about those. Um, and of course, you know, discuss your instrument exogeneity, right? So this means really presenting what theoretical evidence you have for why you think the proposed instruments, you know, are exogenous, um, and particularly being, you know, transparent about your context, any concerns you might have with uh, the exogeneity of the instrument and how you would expect those potential concerns to affect your instrument and results. Um, of course, again, as much as possible, do, do your test for endogeneity. Um, but really importantly, you know, explain the nature of endogeneity, right? So ex explain the directionality of the bias that you expect um, and potentially examine whether, you know, if, you, if it's available to you, you know, can you examine how endogeneity might differ across different subsamples to try to make kind of more compelling cases for, for the nature of endogeneity. Um, and then the last two, six and seven, I would say these are the ones that we would really push on that we don't see a lot of researchers do. So um, really comparing and discussing IV versus OLS coefficients. There are a number of the papers we examine, um, you know, make, an, make a case for why they're using instrumental variables approaches, but then never actually also show the OLS estimate. So I think actually presenting both IV and OLS coefficients and, you know, being transparent about the relative size of those uh, in your results. So what are a few of examples of, of folks that do this? So we did five um, replications in the paper, um, many of whom have really, really great approaches to these. Um, and so, you know, there's obviously more in the paper and I would recommend looking at some of these, these articles to, to show for good examples of how people um, approach these issues. So I would say in a lot of them, it's, it's frankly about being transparent in the discussion. So for instance, um, you know, this paper talks about, you know, A, it does all the robustness checks, you know, for instrument validity, which we recommend, um, but also talks about, you know, the, the concern that they might have. So if, you know, if the if potential bias goes this way, this is the effect it would have on our, co 
Uh, similarly, you know, this paper, you know, it's just discuss discussing instrument exogeneity. So the authors say, so this is a management science. So we did um, management science and SMJ for these replications. So they say one potential source of concern regarding our instrumental variables approach is the possibility that our instrument is systematically correlated with variation in firm investment opportunities across states, right? So they say what the concern is. They say why, unfortunately, their results don't allow them to kind of directly address it, but that their approach, for instance, is to use, you know, state level um, macroeconomic variables to, to, try to, to try to intervene, right? So, um, you know, they're, it's not necessarily a perfect fix, but they're acknowledging what the issue is, how they're trying to address it, right? That sort of transparency. Um, similarly, you know, explaining the nature of endogeneity, right? So um, in this case, uh, the, the author says, you know, some unobserved characteristics of the owner or the firm may make the owner more likely to become a manager and simultaneously affect firm performance. Right. So here's the characteristic that could potentially be dry, driving both the outcome variable and the key dependent variable. Um, and so she discusses kind of in detail how that relationship would go and how it would affect their results. Um, and then lastly, there were very few of the papers that that um, that that did this, but, you know, predicting, discussing and analyzing the kind of IV versus OLS coefficients. Right. So in this case, for instance, the author is like very clear, says, interestingly, the economic significance of the effect is much larger in 2SLS than in OLS. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that's obviously very clear. They discuss why they why they think that might occur um, and, and how it could result from that. So I think, you know, I think that would be one of the, the highest level, um, the biggest takeaway. So obviously there are a number of different techniques. You know, this is what I just presented was essentially making the case for transparency and actually presenting your full results in terms of first stage results, as well as your, your OLS results. But there's a number of different ways that I think are consistent with the message that we're trying to convey, right? I think one of the key takeaways is that the, the choice of your IVs, you know, and how weak the IV is in your particular setting, uh, whether or not there's endogeneity, those can have really big effects on the point estimates that you that you make. And so I think what's, you know, I think methods that are essentially reducing the desire to claim your one particular point estimate as necessarily the, the right estimate um, are, are ones that we would advocate for. So this kind of, you know, would allow researchers to, in, to engage with their OLS and IV estimates in a more transparent fashion, right? So that includes things like using maps, um, as Evan mentioned, potentially considering things like ITCD, where you can really say, you know, is this a case where we actually ought to be using instrumental variables approaching? Um, I added in uh, this one from Evan's presentation, so I think that's really cool, and I'm excited to learn more about that. Um, potentially, there's also different alternatives to 2SLS, right? So I didn't go into this in this presentation, but of course, one of the concerns with 2SLS is that it's estimating kind of a local average treatment effect as opposed to just your average treatment effect. So are there, you know, there's some new methods that, that consider that um, using different types of models. Um, and what was really cool, and I just wanted to highlight this, is, you know, we estimated that in one of the replications we did. Um, so he has, they have a GMMM location scale model that, that's supposed to, um, to estimate the average treatment effect. And we actually find a coefficient of really similar magnitude to what we did in, in the extension of their IV approach. And so I think this, you know, idea of, um, you know, potentially triangulating uh, your results is, is quite useful. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's novel uh, approaches even within the instrumental variables technique. So um, directionality has been something that, you know, even Angus has been talking about recently of kind of using sign restrictions in the first stage. So I think being more, um, you know, us being more transparent and discussing directionality is something that we could work towards. Um, and lastly, of course, you know, I, I kind of, so we shouldn't do this too much, but there is some ability to consider relative magnitudes of coefficients that I just hesitate that there's, it's not like a magic be all end all solution. So um, what is the key takeaway? I just wanted to, um, to put this up as, as I end. So, um, so in particular, you know, I, so the, the intent of this paper is, is to suggest that because of the sensitivity of IV estimates to the particular IV used, it is essential that papers be theoretically motivated with perhaps a range of estimates discussed, as well as providing uh, the justification for why a narrower range may be determined to be more likely. Um, so I think that was that's kind of the broader takeaway that we would hope um, that you would take from this paper.
Um, again, I'm happy to discuss more, happy to share a manuscript um, of this paper uh, shortly. And with that, I will uh, wrap up and address questions in the chat while, while I turn it over back to Brent and to Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so we are going to move. Um, we'll have questions in the chat and we'll have some more general questions afterwards. And now I'm gonna ask Chris to uh, drop some wisdom. All right, I'll, I'll do my best. Hi everyone. All right, thank you, Sarah and Evan. I, I learned a lot from your presentations. Uh, it's gonna be very helpful for doing my work and for uh, advising students handling manuscripts. So really appreciate it. All right, so I, I thought that I would, uh, one, most importantly, be short. Uh, but to uh, offer some perspective uh, as an editor and a researcher, uh, I think that in discussions of, of endogeneity, uh, I, I've been an editor now, I guess, almost eight years at ASQ, Management Science and Org Science. Uh, there, there's three ways in which frustrations about endogeneity, I think, manifest in the review process. One, one is what I'll call instrumentality. And this gets at a lot of the issues that uh, Evan and Sarah mentioned which is that there's an insincere attempt to actually use the instrument in a theoretically meaningful way. Uh, there's not much discussion about why or what we should expect. Uh, or in Evan's case, the, the idea that, you know, we want to triangulate amongst multiple methods and engage in sensitivity analysis, other than, um, you know, basically preserving uh, our key result, all right, which I think is frustrating for reviewers and editors alike. Uh, this gets to the point of robustness checks. Many robustness checks sections say that we correct for endogeneity or we test for endogeneity and great news, our key result is preserved. And, and th these often come across as disappointing uh, to, to readers. And you know, the most common way in which this manifests is the classic, there's a theory analysis disconnect. And, and so I think that by engaging with these methods, uh, by considering these as, as I'll try to um, point out, ex ante in our research designs, we can avoid a lot of these frustrations as authors, as reviewers and editors uh, and advances the field. And so as a researcher, I've developed an appreciation over time for the, the great complexity uh, in, in endogenous relationships. It's also piqued my curiosity uh, in trying to understand phenomena. And, and probably most importantly, uh, it's been very humbling uh, to realize that my interpretations, uh, once I became more sophisticated with methods, uh, my interpretations were not as sound as I thought they were. And uh, at first that's, that was quite disappointing, but I think that's become uh, more satisfying and actually fulfilling over time. And I hope you'll feel the same way. All right, so I have really only two points and I'll, I'll try and emphasize these as I go through. This is, endogeneity is a recurring concern in strategy research for the reasons that uh, both Evan and, and, and Sarah discussed. We're fundamentally concerned with firms making different choices. And so this is something that it really, in our field is critical that we be comfortable um, thinking about endogeneity. But it's also more than an empirical nuisance. And, and so I wanna try and impress upon us that um, it's great to tool up on methods and, and to stay at the cutting edge of the frontier, but it's great because it allows us to have more theoretical insight into what we're doing, not necessarily because it makes our results more robust, right? And I think that this is something that, uh, especially early in one's career, I was guilty of this myself, we want to make sure that our effects are well identified. And so we have a lot of anxiety about ruling out endogeneity as opposed to integrating it into our theoretical frameworks. And so to emphasize the first point, we can go back probably even further, but at least to, to Miles Shaver's uh, 98 Management Science paper, where that really lays out the, uh, the strategy specific concerns about endogeneity. All right, so this is in 1998. All right, in 2003, five years later, now we have to correct for endogeneity and strategic management research. We've been introduced to methods uh, from economics that would be very helpful uh, in conducting strategy research. We understand that there are perils of endogeneity and instrumental variables in strategy research. In 2013, there's yet another paper. This conversation has been ongoing and we have discussed this in many, many uh, venues. All right, so one being uh, the CCC consortium in 2014, Sarah Kaplan, myself, and Tim Simcoe uh, discussed uh, endogeneity experiments and identification. Uh, one of the concerns at that point in, in our evolution uh, was the idea that we were over-focusing on identification 
and not developing theory. Uh, and this has been a recurring concern, all right? We've provided much training on indigenous aid with, with uh, programs like this, all right? So we can look to, for example, Academy of Management in 2014, do I have an endogenous aid problem and does not matter? I think um, we, we recognize that we often do have an endogenous aid pro problem. Um, and I think we've gone to the point where we, we do realize it matters. Uh, and so there has been some progress, but we still continue to have very similar conversations. Very helpful paper by Sarah uh, and my colleague Jordan Siegel on misaccounting for endogeneity. How, despite the evolution of methods, we aren't quite using them to their full potential, all right, or staying at the cutting edge and keeping up with some of the developments in economics that Evan shared with us. And so we often treat this as something, a concern that must be ruled out or mitigated. And so my point is that we can actually gain more by treating this not as an empirical nuisance, a problem to solve, but rather one to integrate into the way in which we design research. And if we do that, I don't think we have to look at this as a methodology practice divide or a macro micro research divide. Uh, they're actually just different theoretical mechanisms that we're concerned about. And endogeneity gives us an opportunity to think through empirical tests that help us understand how the social processes that we are most often interested in, in markets and firms and industries, are characterized by endogeneity. But there are also causal effects that can be independent of endogeneity. And, and so, you know, I, I, I'm going to be a little bit provocative here, recognizing this is not really a false dichotomy. But as we think about the kinds of PDWs and workshops we've been having over the past two decades, including this one, there's a guiding belief. That is, we need to do research differently. And is it that we need different methods or we need different designs? Now, obviously, these, these are not mutually exclusive, all right? But in, in terms of the emphasis, I'm gonna try and take a, a stance here that we need different designs that focus more on theory if we're to gain the full value of the cutting edge methods of the type that Evan and Sarah have shared with us. Okay, so I'm gonna reframe this as designing endogeneity, all right, that we're gonna to try to develop designs uh, that allow us to, to understand uh, endogenous processes and make them something that is a key feature of the studies we, we publish. All right, so this builds on my, my idea in teaching methods courses to doctoral students, all right, where I have a, a you know, I think it's cute, you may think differently, uh, saying that, that what we're really trying to do is generate differences and inferences Evan, you'll like that. It's a trick on uh, differences, and I'll explain it later. Yeah. So, so what we do here, right, is we're trying to relate our work to prior work, right? That is, I have a theorized mechanism, but before I can demonstrate support for my my favorite mechanism, I want to affirm some of the readers' priors, the audience's priors, establish yes, yes, that's right, just like and Goldfarb 2012, all right? That in model one, I wanna affirm the audience's priors about X prior. Through replication, there's an established inference, all right? I try to come up with a three model approach before I start estimating or start even designing, uh, collecting data, all right? So in the design, I'm thinking, if I could restrict my regression table to only three models, what would those three be? Well, first, I want to replicate Goldfarb 2012, all right? I want to affirm this via replication. But then I'm proposing perhaps a different construct that has a different measure associated with it that gives us some novel inference that I want to demonstrate in Model 2. And in doing so, I obligate myself in Model 3 to reconcile the two. And so within this framework, we're trying to affirm some priors in Model 1, demonstrate some difference in model two, deny some of those priors. Under certain conditions, Goldfarb's 2012 effect doesn't hold, or it's actually stronger under some conditions than others, or there's yet another independent effect that also explains some of the variance in the outcome, all right? So if this is my intellectual obligation, this informs my design for incorporating endogeneity, which is that the, in the, the business of, of developing explanations for why, there are multiple mechanisms that can account for the same phenomena. And while we typically want to focus on one, it behooves us, I think, to integrate alternatives, right? And to do this by design, 
so that endogeneity is not an empirical nuisance. It's actually a process associated with an alternative theory that helps us understand the phenomenon. Okay, so imagine this. We have our classic story about X causes Y, perhaps Y causes X or expectations of Y cause X, or we have classic reciprocal causation or simultaneity, that, that X and Y both exert causal influences on each other. Oftentimes in strategy, what we're trying to do is eliminate the second two and focus the reader on the X causes Y relationship. All right, so if we start with this, this is typically our goal. Well, it rules out our interest in elaborating the theories that support the other two. All right, and so let me lay out an example here. Okay, this is my theory. My theory is that X causes Y. Now, in trying to demonstrate support for my theory, I want to rule out the possibility that Y causes X, the possibility of reciprocal causation, or the possibility that some omitted variable, I'll just call X prime, all right, uh, causes Y, okay? And so typically we focus on this, all right? And, and I would want to make the, the argument that in trying to focus on establishing this causal effect, we limit ourselves to integrating the other plausible mechanisms. They're, they're plausible under some circumstances for sure, all right? And perhaps even in the setting in which we're studying. And rather than trying to rule them out, it's actually beneficial to us to think about the conditions under which they do inform our understanding of the phenomenon. And then that treats endogeneity as a theoretical mechanism to consider as opposed to an empirical nuisance. So for example, I've, I've done a, a lot of reading of, of John Elster uh, recently as I've developed my methods course and, and his work on explanation. And, and so in constructing social science theories, Elster uh, says that, you know, typically we start by trying to support our arguments from above. That is, there's higher level theory we deduce typically, if not in pro actual practice and presentation, right? But it doesn't have to be deductive. It can also be deductive. From higher level theory, we deduce a hypothesis that explains something and explain it all right? And so this is often where we're focused in our research, but around that, Elster has a very helpful diagram. If what we wanna do is explain phenomena, which is often what we are after in, in strategy, things like mobility, patenting, innovation, firm survival. Well, there are alternative mechanisms that include endogenous processes. And so, Elster has this really helpful diagram in which we take our core hypothesis deduced from theory, try to support the argument from above, and that has implications. And we support our argument uh, from below, that is, if the implications of our argument are also observed uh, empirically. And so we can infer that because we have additional explanatory power for our preferred story, that it's more likely that that mechanism is what's causing the, the outcome. Now, there's also lateral support, and this is what I think is most helpful and most often neglected uh, in strategy research, which is finding lateral support. When we often treat this as alternative explanations, here we have alternative hypotheses one and two, fail related tests, that they don't, they might explain the exp uh, explanatum all right, but the implications are not fully supported, at least not as strongly as our preferred. And so if, as we think about this, we have our preferred mechanism, and that's often the causal effect X causes Y in our diagram. However, there are alternative hypotheses, alternative mechanisms, AH1 and AH2, that might also explain that out. And so typically, I think what we're doing in our research is trying to rule out mechanisms AH1 and AH2. But those mechanisms seem to be viable in many cases, and they might include endogeneity. So imagine a situation in which you have X causes Y as your preferred mechanism, all right? Well, it's possible that Y causes X, all right? You have the reciprocal causation. It's possible that Z actually causes Y and is correlated with X, it's omitted variable. And in trying to rule those out, we miss the opportunity to demonstrate how our mechanism is different. And if we're doing that, I think it's less likely that we would end up doing what Sarah demonstrated is often done. That is, we only report 
the IV second st two stage least squares results, right? Or we only report the endogeneity corrections. We don't even, in, much less, you know, report them. We're not interpreting the difference between the OLS and, and the corrected versions. And theoretically, that should be meaningful. If there is indeed endogeneity and we have a good instrument, then we should be able to draw some theoretical inferences, produce those differences in inferences about how our theory is different from the current understanding about the phenomenon. But I think because we're treating endogeneity oftentimes as an empirical nuisance, we're missing that opportunity to enrich our understanding about what causes the phenomenon and how endogenous processes and exogenous influences occur in parallel. And so what I want to encourage folks to do, and I'm, I've been doing more and more of this in my, my editorial service, is to think not only about supporting our arguments from above with theory and trying to rule out alternative mechanisms, but rather to try and get support from below. What else can be explained? What other implications? Uh, I've seen Evan do this in his work, for example, and, and, and Brent and Sarah as well, all right, in which they're looking beyond the hypotheses to find results that are also consistent with the interpretation, even though they're, they're not elevated to the, the level of hypothesis, of course, because they're being abductive at that point, all right? But also to treat this as an opportunity for lateral, or su lateral support for our causal argument, that there are times in which endogeneity is indeed a concern in interpreting this causally, but it's also an influence on the outcome of interest. And in demonstrating that, we give ourselves an opportunity to have others build upon that understanding. And so you might ask, well, do you have an example? Well, I found one in ASQ that's always been, since I was a doctoral student, I, I suppose, um, one, of, one of my favorite papers, one that, that treats uh, endogeneity is a, of theoretical importance, not just an empirical nuisance. And this is a nice paper by Olaf Sorensen and, and uh, Nathan, or uh, Evan and, and Brent's uh, colleague, Dave Wagesback, all right, where embeddedness is a well-established phenomenon in sociology. Uh, it's one that's certainly made its, its uh, presence known in management and strategy as well. And we often believe that embedded exchange works in two directions. Yet typically, we found it most useful to explain performance. That is, embeddedness causes performance. And so what Olav and Dave have done in this paper is say it's also possible that you know, expectations of performance lead to greater embeddedness, that the resource allocations and embedded relationships are endogenous. And if we treat this as theoretically meaningful, we have an opportunity to affirm priors about embeddedness, but also to generate differences and in inferences about how this endogenous behavior changes our understanding of the relationship between endogeneity and performance, or embeddedness and performance, I should say, too many E's. All right, so, so just these are, are my key points that because it's a recurring concern strategy research, we, they're great methods, all right, that um, are, are being developed. We saw many of those today. There are, we can draw inferences from multiple methods, the sensitivity analyses of, of the type that Evan shared with us. But we draw better inferences when we've thought through endogenous processes as of theoretical importance and not just empirical nuisance. And so I am of the belief that a sophisticated method, one in which you've pre-registered and specified a mechanism, or you've got a great strong instrument as Sarah laid out, is most compelling when it addresses something of great theoretical importance. And so I want to encourage you to treat endogeneity as a theoretically motivated design feature and not just an empirical nuisance, one that must be slayed uh, for you to demonstrate support for your preferred mechanism, all right? Thank you, Brent, and, and for uh, inviting me and Sarah and, and uh, looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Yay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, so um, uh, I, I, I was just super pleased to see these presentations and how they tied into our earlier presentations and, and, and sessions. I've posted links to both of those sessions at the chat so you can, um, I, I know sometimes you wanna watch Netflix or you wanna watch, uh, I don't know, Hulu, Apple TV, whatever you watch, but you can just go to YouTube and this is free 
and watch these prior presentations with the family. Um, I'm, I'm sure that'll be uh, super, super entertaining. Um, if, uh, there, 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 there aren't any open questions, so um, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna just ask and, and throw out a couple, a, a couple questions that um, I, I came up with. And, and the first one I'm gonna direct at Evan, and this is a little bit reflective of the answer that he just put in the Q and A about a, a, a particular alternative method that uh, Jeffrey Wooldridge who's like not a slouch, um, uh, has, has pointed out. And um, one of the things that were, that, that, that Evan and Sarah have, have really elevated are some like really recent developments in methods um, coming from our, our, our neighbors in, in economics mostly. And so the question I have is, what do you do because we don't know which one of these to use. Like, what do we know if five years from now, one of these fault, like we, we discover that um, there's a big flaw or something like that, it hasn't really been vetted that much. So um, is there risk associated with using these latest and only hopefully greatest methods? You, you sent that my way? Th I, thank you for that. Yeah, sure. Uh, no <laughs> I think my initial reaction is that we have learned so much about OLS in the last four years, even though OLS has been around for, uh, you probably know Brent when, it, when OLS first came out, but <laughs> many, many, a long time. A hundred at least. So I, I think what, what we are understand, what we are beginning to understand is the precise ways that, uh, that, this uh, at least OLS procedure has been uh, been been working in the, the circumstances under which it doesn't work well, and I think that we are beginning to question the assumptions uh, that that we've made about how this thing is working. Thanks to very clever econometricians, very applied folks who care about causal questions, and uh, so like the, the fact that, for example, in in, a, in staggered adoption models with um, with heterogeneous effects, you know. We 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 we've been running those models for so long. We don't think twice about it. We think they're they're perfectly identified. And the fact that you can get the opposite sign is just mind blowing. And it's it's, it's nothing that it's just how OLS works. So my my sense is that the new methods, uh, in general, you, you do the old thing that everyone expects. And part of that is strategic because in the reviewer pool, you're going to find people who don't know these new methods. And, uh, and if you try to bring in a new method they're not familiar with, you, you're probably going to get pushback. So my, my general guidance is to start with the things that people would expect, but then also have run the newfangled stuff in case you get somebody like me as a reviewer. And, um, and then, you know, and then uh, if there are discrepancies, then that's where you have to dig in and, uh, and be clear on precisely what the differences are between what people thought was right and what now you think is, is right. And when you do find those differences, it's, it's really important to be clear on why they exist and what's driving them. And so I think that, you know, there's a sense in which the methods you're using today may be, may be obsolete in the future. Uh, but we definitely don't know which of these new staggered adoption models is gonna, gonna be the, the, the champion. I think that they tend to give broadly similar results based on some initial analyses that, that we've done in, in our, in our uh, data set, but that may not be true in all circumstances. Uh, and so I think that, we're, you know, that there's a lot, there's a lot going on here, but I think it's all pushing on what's the comparison that you really want to make. And, um, and sometimes I, you know, I, I, you can't make the comparison that you want to make because of uh, various endogeneity issues. And I, I just want to echo what Chris said and say that that's not always a problem. In fact, the endogeneity part may be the most interesting part of your, your paper. You know, for us, the fact that we observe that this uh, this big dip, this enormous dip in mobility before workers uh, uh, apply for a patent, is fascinating. What's driving that? What is the, what are the implications of that? Um, you know, so in in my view, the, those sorts of findings actually open up more questions down the road. So I'm not sure that answers any of your questions in a satisfactory way, but but those can are. Some I add a, can I yeah. add a little bit to that because that was fantastic. So I think it's a really key question, and I think it nicely kind of like combines all of our uh, presentations because. You know, I think like if I think about papers I'm reviewing, right, the most compelling papers are not ones that necessarily are like this paper came out last, you know, this data command came out last week and here's 20 different data commands that were all from the last two years. 
Um, but, uh, you know, as Evan says, kind of pairing that with, you know, here, here was the OLS and then pairing with what Chris said of like, okay, and here's the concern, right? Here's why I'm using this other method, right? Like being really transparent about not just like, oh, this is really new and it's a hot new method. So I'm going to do it because I read an economics journal, but like, I, I understand what the issue is in my data, or at least I have, I have a, you know, a thought of what an issue might be. Um, here's how it would, it would change. Here's how my estimate would change if I then use this other method, method or, or you know, I do this other method. Here's why that makes sense, conditional on what I understand about my data and understand about my context. I mean, I think that sort of approach, like if I'm a reviewer, is so compelling. I mean, obviously take it with a grain of salt because this is like my jam, but it's like so compelling, right? Um, that you've you've been thoughtful about um, what's happening in your data and your context, how it fits with theory, and how you know methods might be able to to address it. I, I'd, I'd also add that that simulations can really be your friend here, and that uh, sometimes it's not obvious to what's going on. So you know my my approach, which Brent and I teach in our methods course, is. Uh, and we have several, I think, of our students here. So I don't know if they, they don't want to share whether they had a good experience or not, but uh, is to just go, go for the simplest possible econometric uh, specification that you can, do the simplest possible algebra to get your estimator, and then simulate it to make sure that you understand what is actually going on. And you can get most of the way with, with just that. Um, so that's, that's sort of, at least that's our approach to teaching econometrics. <laughs> Um, but, but that can also help in the view process if you have a reviewer who's confused and uh, you can really help elucidate, elucidate what's going on. So can I just uh, append a comment to, you know, I think that um, the choice of method could be anxiety inducing if we're focused on, on being right. And of course, we, we do want to get it right, as right as we can prior to publication. And we take great pride in our work. But I think if we, we change our orientation to wanting to be useful to future research, then really our obligation is not necessarily to, to get it right, but rather to do the best we can with the available methods and be clear in how we're using them and interpreting them. So that, you know, when, when Brent sees that uh, I would have done that differently than what Chris did, um, he, he can replicate that result, but then elucidate how we get a different understanding when you make different identifying assumptions or use a method that wasn't available five years ago. Uh, and so, I know early in your career, we, we, we invest in methods sort of out of anxiety that we're getting it wrong. Um, and so I just want to say that, you know, for, for the folks here who are still doctoral students or earlier in their career, it's okay to get it wrong. Um, it's, it's less okay to be unclear. All right. So, so just focus on clarity. It, can, I, can I just repeat what Chris just said? I love, love, love that statement. It's okay to be wrong. Just be super clear because we may be wrong. We don't know when we're going to be wrong, but if we're clear about how we got there, then somebody can come back later and, and use that information to say, oh, they did the best they could with what we had at that time. And, but now it's really easy to build on that to make this correction because we've discovered X, Y, Z that we just today as we sit here can't know about because it hasn't happened yet. That's powerful. I, 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 I really like, like that. Um, this leads to a related, I have two related questions. Uh, and then, um, so, so the first one is, well, given what we just said, how should we interpret and write about prior work that hasn't, like they couldn't use these methods? We're citing things from like last year. Uh, my, my, my answer, Brent, is maybe strategic, but uh, very generously, because those people are almost certainly going to be your reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my, my, my sense is that you want to give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, uh, and that we're all limited in our knowledge. And we, you know, we get to learn every day in, in what we're doing. So, you know, the fact that these people may not, not run something that you're aware of, uh, I think being generous, but, um, but also clear and precise, you know, I mean, I think that you're right. This is moving so fast that what we're writing today could be out of date tomorrow. And, um, and that, 
that hopefully if you're in that situation where, where you're the one who got it wrong, people will be generous with you. <laughs> uh, and you can acknowledge like, wow, I, I didn't know that what I was doing was, was doing something implicit that I didn't you know, realize. And we can all acknowledge that and, and move forward as a field. So, so generous towards the person, not necessarily generous towards the fact. Is that, or the interpretation, is that, is that what I heard? I guess, I guess I just mean like, I don't want, you don't want to go on a spree telling that everyone they're wrong. It's not going to get published that way for sure. But I just, did, you know, in terms of like what was available at the time may have been the most frontier thing possible. And, you know, um, and just because you, you have a newfangled method doesn't mean uh, that, that uh, you should, you should disparage other people's work. I think, you know, being generous with, with, uh, you know, and, and clear about why what you're doing is better and, and different. And hopefully th they would agree. Hopefully they would agree. You write it in a way that they would say, yeah, wow, you're right. Like mess that up. So, well, so I, I, if I could just encourage that, that um, I, I agree with them to be generous in your interpretation uh, of prior work. I, I think that um, we should be mindful that, you know, oftentimes papers are published, but they were actually written years before that and, and use the best methods of the time. And there's, a, there's a lag. All right. Uh, and, you know, beyond that, I, I would hope that if I make a mistake, or I draw a wrong inference because I was doing the best I could with the tools I had available at the time uh, that Evan would be charitable. I think that if what we're trying to do is change people's beliefs about a phenomenon or a mechanism or a theory, then we're more effective, not by telling them that they're wrong, but, oh, hey, you left off the path back there, and now we can go forward a little bit further, and here's what I see up here. Uh, and, and so I try to think of you know, my differences and inferences as trying to take a good Bayesian presenting them with new evidence and building on their prior uh, to help them update their belief. And, and that's the treatment I would want. And so that's the treatment I would encourage you to try to give prior authors as well. Um, yes, yes, do unto others what you would want unto yourself, the rest is commentary, something like that. Uh, so yes, I love that humility, not arrogance, will get you, will, will, is, is the way we can move forward as a community in light of in our, you know, we're trying to figure out things that nobody knows. Uh, and so that's what makes it wonderful and also also challenging. Um, we, we got a, a comment. So Christina, do you wanna ask your question out loud? Um, I'm hoping Ryan can, can allow Christina to speak. Okay, now I am able to speak. Can you hear me? <laughs> no, so um, one of my new pet peeves is um, not related to the estimation technique, but when we're trying to decide what uh, variables to put in a model, and you might have some concern about something that conceptually or theoretically we would, uh, you know, would, would change our estimates or change our inference, and you throw it in a quote unquote robustness check. And then you say, this is great. It doesn't change it. And I think this is bad because I think it should. And then they just get on with their lives. And so it's a little bit, it's quite related to what you're talking about, but it's less about the techniques per se and more about, you know, you have a data set and you get to make choices about how you use the data to hand. And this I find particularly troublesome. Chris, I think this is a question for you. Quite honestly. So, so uh, I, Christina, I, I share this as, as a pet peeve. I, I'd say that um, our robustness checks section have, have become, and perhaps this is part of the, the downside of the review process, is that they become basically exercises in results preservation. That is, I, I have a key result, and I'm going to show you all the conditions under which I can still be right or feel like I am right. Um, and this is very frustrating uh, to read as a reviewer. I think it's really frustrating to read as a reader in a published paper as well. You know, the, the conditions under which we don't find support for our hypotheses are, are, are also important. And obviously wanting to be mindful of things like measurement error and null effects, et cetera, et cetera. But showing uh, the, the conditions under which a theorized effect breaks down should be part of a robustness check section. And I think in most many good papers they are. Um, so, so I would encourage authors to treat the robustness check section not as a results preservation exercise, uh, 
but as a you know a more abductive exercise in post hoc analysis that tells us something more about the theoretical mechanisms underlying the result, the identifying assumptions under which we can infer that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, can I add to that? I guess I can because I'm the moderator. Um, so uh, I, I just wanted to add that one of the things that's really, really clear from all of the presentations and perhaps Chris's in particular is like when we get to a, an explanation for whatever we're looking at, we don't really know if that's the truth. We can't know because, and, and this was really the subject of the last session a, a, a little bit. And, and because of that, if we have, Christina, like my answer to you would be, if, if we have that phenomenon where we're expecting a result that doesn't show up, it means that there's some weakness in our explanation, or it could mean it's random, that it should be there. And sometimes you just don't measure something that, that you expect due to randomness. Like that is that definitely can happen and, and will happen. And, and so this should then show up as a part, as a discussion point. And, and like, here's the best, here's the best explanation I have Here's why I might be concerned about it, and um, to qualify our beliefs in some way. Christina, can I can I clear? So I, maybe I'm confused on precisely what your your question is, but you have a situation where you you think a control should you know you throw in the control and it should dissipate the the effect or something or magnify it and and. And you're, you're saying, what do we do if we don't see that? Is that yeah, right? So my, my concern is that, um, you know, if you, as you're discussing the phenomenon and, and then you say, well, we probably should worry that, you know, this factor would influence our results and we check for it and it's not there so we can rule it out. And I think, hmm, <laughs> I mean, I'm not comforted by that, let me say. So like, I would have been happier had this concern been articulated and the results had been wiped out, changed, amplified, reduced something. So we expect a result, we don't see it. And then the conclusion is hunky-dory, not ooh, we should worry. And so that I guess that's my thing. It wasn't, it was more to raise the point about not just these estimation techniques, but this whole exercise of robustness and what we could and should helpfully honestly conclude in that process yeah. that was all got it i mean uh, the, the paper that's coming to mind uh, christina do you know the denardo and pishki uh, pencils paper uh it's one of my favorite it's one, one of my, my all-time favorites because it's really helpful when you study computers and it <laughs> oh yeah yeah so is that is that kind of an example so for those who don't know that this um there's a famous paper by alan kruger on the returns to using uh computers in the QJE, and if you work with a computer, it raises your wages by like 15%. It's a very careful study. It's like, it's very thoughtful in a, so many ways. But uh, John DiNardo and Steve Pischke were very skeptical that working with a computer mattered all that much. So they went and they got data from Germany where they collected information on other things that you access in the workplace. And it turns out if, if you, uh, they replicate the computer wage premium that Kruger did, but it also turns out that uh, you have a premium for working with a pencil. And so their 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 conclusion was that uh, if you you know if you think working with a pencil also has this wage premium that we we wouldn't expect that there's nothing particularly useful about a pencil everyone has skills they can write etc you would expect there to be no effect there and yet we see something and so that suggests some unobservables might be driving both the pencil effect that are also driving the computer effect so that's like their conclusion so is that is that what you have in mind Christina something along those lines um something like that but that's that just even like um you know that's sort of like an alternative explanation i'm thinking about maybe like a a mediator or a moderator effect as well that um you know you have available in the data um or so the thing you know so my obsession and i don't want this to be all about my obsessions i apologize but um you know when we think about the use of frontier technology in firms and we think about intangibles and we think that there could be some very important interactions between unobservables in the firm 
um, their underlying capabilities, some of these core strategy questions and the technology, um, putting in a fixed effect strips all that out, right? And so there's this approach in IT productivity research that we absolutely want to control for the unobserved features of the firm. So we'll put a fixed effect in. And my concern there is that we know this tends to really pull down the estimate. But then the inference is that, you know, we found like a, a lower bound on IT when in fact what we've done is deeply penalize what the true effect in the world is likely to be. And um, for the first time ever, I'm finding that this turns the results all the way around if we're thinking about something like the cloud or something very, very new where uh, intangibles are a problem for using this well. And I don't think the conclusion is that use of the cloud is bad um, <laughs> when you strip that stuff out, but it's that there's this interesting interaction. And so what you don't want to do is say, yeah, I've put all these things in and now I'm happy. Um, it should be, wow, I put all these things in and there's problems or there's other things that we worry about and just be more nuanced rather than I'm happy because nothing changed, even when I was worried that it would change. Am I being, I'm not sure I'm being clear. I'm trying to be general while obsessing intensely on my own particular papers. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I have one, just one thought to that, which is like, you know, I wonder whether part of it is also framing, right? Which is rather than saying, you know, we, we a lot of times write our papers like, this is the result, here's the clear one clear point, um, as opposed to saying like, you know, uh, as you say, like part of it might be, oh, here's what I found under certain circumstances, you know, and then you write your paper and I would expect it to change under this, this other case, you know, or with this additional variable or under this contingencies. And it doesn't, you know, and either leaving that as what could possibly drive that, there should be room for, you know, future work where there's more data or, you know, this might pose a problem, right? I think just, I don't know. So for me, I think that that kind of points to that broader issue, which is, um, you know, like really staking our claim in one, that one coefficient that we need to preserve um, rather than writing it as like, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to use the word like exploration, but kind of an exploration, right? And like, kind of like what Chris was saying, a Bayesian updating, you know, this is some evidence that might point to this. And here's some point where it's unclear whether future, you know, whatever it is. But I think it's really consistent with that type of um, concern in, in how we write and discuss our, uh, both our own work and work that we cite, frankly, right? Um, the way I think about it, Christina, it's like, it's like, when you throw in those fixed facts, you're changing the, the comparison that you're using to identify. Right. And so it's like, you know, that some comparisons have, have certain problems, minute variables, whatever it is, other comparisons have fewer of those problems, but there's also other problems that could arise with that different comparison. So, you know, I, I, in your, in your particular case, you know, fixed effects models tend to wipe out lots of variation, right. Um, that looking only within. So my sense is that, you know, I, I would, I would be very clear on what, what precise comparison you're making and, and why theoretically we would actually expect maybe differential results, or maybe endogeneity is a bigger concern uh, once you have thrown in those fixed effects because the within variation you're exploiting may be similarly driven by endogenous variables. Uh, so there are many variables. So, so I, I just wanna, um, this lead, like this, this again comes back, Chris was, was such a great summary for, for this session because the, the first two paper, the first two presentations we're very focused on how do we use statistical techniques to identify a particular causal mechanism, which of course is really interesting for a variety of questions. Uh, but Chris pointed out, it's like, well, wait a minute, right? Like we live in a very multi cause we're studying organizations in large part. And so if you study organizations, you should expect that whatever you're working with is going to interact and, 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 and be magnified or not by, it's just going to interact in different ways with the environment. And sometimes a causal, he was like pointing out causal direction can go the other way, right? And Christina, that, that seems to come back to your point. It's like, why, like the premise of the question that we should ask, why should we try to identify the effect of using a computer when certainly using a computer is going to require a host of other organizational changes in order to be useful, right? Like that premise in and itself is, is, is very narrow. And I understand the history of asking that question, 
But it's not clear it's the right question anyway. Right, which I think, Chris, was kind of your story. Right? It, it might be the right question, but, but it, it, it goes along with several others. Right. And, and so um, I'm just going to uh, be cognizant of the time. I'm not going to open up a new question with three minutes to go. Um, rather, I'm going to use those, those few minutes to thank uh, the, the 50 people still in this room and uh, thank our speakers today, Evan, the shadowy Evan, for whatever reason, the light's not good, uh, Sarah and, and Chris for just excellent, excellent uh, presentations uh, that, that from which, and, and very thoughtful. And um, this wraps up our series. Uh, we will you know, stay tuned to 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 the 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 methods community uh, we're not an interest group we are a community uh, the community for for further programming and further things that that we're gonna um, try to do as we move forward so thank you very much and that'll wrap up the the day thanks Brent and hope to see you all in London oh yeah London beer. <laughs>